Exciting title, eh? Today, we're going to be learning how to render these. It's called a circle. And yes, I did print that. So circles seem like they should be really easy to render, but they're not. See, the thing is modern day GPUs and graphics APIs such as DirectX, OpenGL, Vulkan, Metal, all of that stuff, they like to deal with triangles. And that's great if you're trying to render a triangle or like a rectangle because that's composed of two triangles or even some kind of like 3D mesh. That works great. But circles, circles are round. Circles are smooth, circles are soft. I guess I'm not sure if they're necessarily soft, but I imagine they are. They have this like nice smooth edge. So how are you supposed to have a smooth edge if you're rendering triangles? Jagged line, straight line triangles. That just doesn't seem to work very well. So that's why I thought I'd make this video. We're going to learn all about how we can actually render those smooth, soft circles. And we're going to be achieving this by simply taking like the triangles out of the equation. We're not going to try and create our circle out of actual geometry. We're just going to create like a canvas for ourselves and then write a shader that will actually create a nice, smooth, soft circle for us. But before we jump into that, is there a way that we could just render the circle out of triangles? And of course we can. In fact, that's a pretty common and popular way. We could just simply create a triangle fan that goes all around our circle, but then we have this problem of, but how many triangles do we use? Because if we use too few, then we'll essentially end up with like a hexagon or an octagon, something that obviously has very jagged edges. And to really make this smooth, especially if you zoom the camera right into that, or if the camera just gets really close to that geometry to make it actually look smooth, you would have to use a lot of triangles. Now, modern day GPUs are pretty good at dealing with triangles, but it's still not exactly ideal. And what if you didn't want like a filled in circle? What if you just want like an outline of a circle, like a like a non-filled in circle, I don't even know what to call that. Well then instead of triangles kind of going from the center outwards, you could just use lines going around the perimeter of the circle. But again, you have this problem of, but how many lines do I use? The more lines I use, the kind of higher resolution that circle becomes, the smoother it becomes. It's kind of a similar problem that you might have if you're modeling like a sphere in Blender or a 3D program or something. You, you want kind of more segments, but that just increases the density of the mesh. Now that's not to say that you should never render circles with triangles or with lines. In fact, that's not Something that we actually do in Hazel, mostly for like debug graphics where like the, the actual fidelity of the circle might not matter as much. So for example, here we're using it to just visualize like the bounds of a point light so that we can see how big it is. And then the last kind of type of circle you might want to render is like a donut essentially. It's like a really thick kind of outline of a circle. For that, you could switch to using a triangle strip instead of like a triangle fan. And then you could still kind of draw that geometrically, that's perfectly fine. But if your goal is to have really nice, smooth, soft, I keep saying soft, round kind of circles, then it's clear that this kind of geometric approach is just not really what you wanna do. So let's dial back circles for a little bit because they really shouldn't be this complex. In fact, they're one of the simplest shapes we can describe because if we were to mathematically describe them, they're simply like a point and then the radius, the size of the circle. In fact, in many ways, they're actually much simpler than a rectangle. That has like, you know, four bounds. This is just a point and a radius. So why is it so difficult to render? Well, again, it's because GPUs love triangles, but what if we just don't worry about about triangles for the sake of this? What if we just create for ourselves a little canvas upon which we can render a beautifully smooth and soft circle? <laughs> We'll kind of create this little canvas for ourselves and then we can write a custom shader, like a pixel shader or a fragment shader, same thing, that will simply render our nice smooth circle using that kind of mathematical principle. And then because it's like a custom shader, we can really do anything we want there. We can create a nice smooth faded transition. We can make the fade really large for a stylistic effect. We have all of this control because we're controlling the entire rendering of the circle within that GPU shader code. And that is precisely what we are going to do. Now, what I'm gonna do for this video is I'm not going to actually go over the implementation of how to do this from start to finish. Instead, we're going to just focus on the actual GLSL shader code. Although if you use HLSL or MSL, this should be very easy to adapt. We're just going to focus on that shader code using a website called Shader Toy, and I'll go pretty deep into it and explain everything. If you guys wanna see some kind of actual integration video, maybe using OpenGL or something like that, where I show you how to actually take that, that from Shader Toy and integrate it properly into an engine, let me know in the comment section below. But otherwise, I think that this should be pretty easy to integrate pretty much anywhere. All you really need to be able to do is just render quads. And those quads need to be, they need to have some kind of 
like good local space attached to them. So for example, in Hazel, the quads, the, ver the vertex positions of the quads go from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. So they have that kind of one by one meter like unit range. Being able to access that like local coordinate space within your fragment shed is gonna be really important as we'll see later. But those are like the draw calls that you need to issue. And this is very easy and probably recommended to actually integrate into like a batch renderer. I have a batch renderer series on my channel. Definitely check that out if you haven't already. There we're rendering quads but you can also easily extend that to render circles instead because the circles are just quads, but using a different shader. So they will need to be in like a separate draw call since they're using a different shader to the, to the quads that are being rendered in the batch renderer. But all of your circles can easily be batched together into a single draw call as well. Even if they're like filled in, not filled in, donuts, whatever. Anyway, I think that's enough talking. Let's dive in and take a look at how we can render circles. Okay, so to explore this, we're gonna be using a website called Shader Toy, Shader Toy com if you haven't heard of this highly recommend it lots of very exciting shaders and it's a great way to learn more about shaders and a lot of the math that goes into rendering graphics in general we're not going to be doing anything as cool as like some of the stuff that we see here that actually has the label warning because it's so complicated but over here on like the right side we have this new button we can press it and we'll just be taken to a blank new shader let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys maybe like that and we can start talking about this okay so what is shader toy how does this help us with with our circle. So what you're seeing here is very simple and it's it's basically the same place that we're at when we're rendering our circles. It is a canvas. This is simply like a full screen quad that is being drawn here that covers this entire surface. And this is the fragment shader that is shading these pixels. So this code over here runs for every single pixel that we have over here. It uses some built-in variables that we can see in shader inputs, such as like time and resolution. And that is what produces these lovely colors that we are seeing here. So let's kind of reduce this to basically nothing because we don't really need any of this like boilerplate code. We can just set the frag color to be like a constant white or something, alt enter to compile. And there we have this, right? So pretend that this area over here is in fact that quad that I mentioned that we have to draw to act as like the canvas for our circle. Now, the first issue that you can see here is that this is not a square right? It's a rectangle. It's 960 by 540. That's a 16, nine aspect ratio. So really it's not, it's not one to one, which means that if we were to mathematically draw a circle here, it would actually fill up the entire width and height, and it would be more of an ellipse. Now let's talk a little bit about why that would happen, why it would be an ellipse and like how we're even going to draw the circle in the first place. So we basically want the ability obviously to draw these circles anywhere in our world, whether that be some kind of screen space element like for UI purposes, or if we want it to be just in the 3D world potentially, or in a 2D world, right? So in world space as well. The way that we achieve that is by having like a game world and then just drawing this kind of uh, square, this quad somewhere in the world, right? So again, if we draw this canvas in which we're going to draw a circle, if we draw that at a particular place in our world, then clearly the circle is also going to be there. So in other words, the position isn't controlled within this shade, it shouldn't be. That's just more of like the actual physical geometry will appear somewhere else. However, the way this is going to work is that inside this kind of square, we're going to have a sort of local space and that local space is going to define what area is basically inside our circle and what area is not. So our goal is to draw something like this, right? This is a very terrible circle, <laughs> but it's a circle that, no, I gotta do that again. Okay, slightly better. So we have this kind of circle within this quad that we're drawing. And of course, this is kind of our two triangles that are actually being drawn here. So if that is the case, then we need some kind of local coordinate system within this actual square, within this quad, so that we can address each pixel. We can't have this be something in world space. We need it to be local to this actual geometry, right? Preferably where the middle would be zero, right? The origin. And then the width and the height shouldn't really matter, but they need to be some kind of constant unit such as one. So we can have negative one for the left, positive one for the right, and then maybe something like that. Now it's common inside like game engines and the way that we're doing this in Hazel as well, it's common to kind of stick to a unit right? Like you want to pick your units and you want to deal with real world units such as meters, not necessarily arbitrary like numbers, right? Because that doesn't make much sense. So pretty much everything we render, all of the primitives in Hazel are one by one meter, 
right? What that means is that when we render like a quad or a circle, we want it to be one meter by one meter, right? So again, that will apply to a circle as well. So what that means is that, well, if these were negative one to one, then that would be two meters, right? Uh, one minus minus one is two. So instead, we basically, when we actually build up this geometry, right, just like we did in the batch renderer series, if you, ta if you take a look at that video series, you'll see that um, we basically have a range of negative 0.5 to 0.5 when we make these actual physical vertices. I'm getting a little bit uh, sidetracked here, like this is, this is more to do with the implementation, but it's important because these are the units that we're actually going to be using, the coordinate system will be using inside the shader, so it's important to understand that. Long story short, we have two triangles that we draw, right, to make up this kind of uh, quad, right? And their vertices are negative 0.5 on this corner and positive 0.5 on this corner, meaning that this is 0.5 for X and Y, that's negative 0.5 for X and Y, and obviously something like over here would be 0.5, positive X, and negative 0.5 on Y. And that, of course, achieves a size of one by one, which is what we're looking for, and circles are no different. Since we have this kind of absolute unit range, that means that if we were to use like a scale matrix to distort this, so a non-uniform scale, if I apply a non-uniform scale, like in the transform component inside my entity in my game engine, then it's going to potentially make this uh, this square, not a square anymore. So it could scale this up, right? And then the vertex shader will apply that scale. Now, the thing with this is that these local units should still stay the same, right? They obviously, these vertices that we'll, that we'll be using will still be 0.5 to 0.5. This will be 0.5, negative 0.5, meaning that our circle will end up being quite long, which might actually be what you want. I think you should be able to distort your circles, scale them non-uniformly. You know, who says we need to have circles? We can have ellipses too. There is room to love them as well. So anyway, I just think it's really important to just realize that like, you know, these vertices or this kind of local coordinate system that we use, that is kind of independent of where the vertices actually end up in our in our rendering because there's just so much at play there, including the transform of the geometry, but also like the view and projection of the camera. But back in Shader Toy, all we are really seeing is that final kind of canvas. And so our first task has to be to like simulate something like this, this negative 0.5 or negative one to one bounds, because if we don't do that, then how are we gonna draw our circle locally? So in this case, in Shader Toy's case, we have this UV coordinate. In your engine or in Hazel, I think it's actually just a local kind of position that is passed in as a vertex attribute, which is then sent into the fragment shader during the rendering pipeline, right? So in other words, we actually send in like negative 0.5 or negative one, I think, and then positive one on the other side, we actually send that in as a vertex attribute. That's what we use as the basis for this. But in this case, we can equally use a UV coordinate, right? Because a UV coordinate, if we actually take a look at this, so if I just do frag color.rg equals UV, right? It is just a number that is zero on this side. Let me just maybe get rid of the blue because it's probably a lot more common to see it like like that. So if we get rid of the blue, then you can see the bottom left is zero, zero. The right side here is one on the X axis. And then we have the green being one on the Y axis, the, the top left and then the top right is just one on both axes, right? So in other words, we have a range here of zero to one. But the problem with this is that it's in it's in a zero to one range, not like a negative one to one range or a negative 0.5 to 0.5 range. We want zero to be in the middle, not in the bottom left corner, because we're going to be using that as the origin point for our circle. To convert this zero to one into negative 0.5 to 0.5, we can simply just subtract 0.5, right? And now you can see that the middle, the very middle of this actually looks like where the black begins because these colors are all negative, they get clipped to zero. And then here we have our actual color, but let's actually convert this into a negative one to one range because that's just gonna be a little bit easier to understand going forward. So we could surround this by parentheses and then just multiply it by two. So that takes the negative 0.5 makes it one and it takes the positive 0.5 also makes it one. Then we have that range here, but you can also just do times two minus one which is probably the more kind of common way of seeing this conversion. And it mathematically gives you the same result, of course. Now, the next thing we have to deal with is the aspect ratio, because this kind of canvas is not a square like we would have. It's a rectangle, 
But that's also something that's very easy to deal with because we have this resolution variable over here. I can easily calculate the aspect ratio here by just dividing X by I resolution Y. This will give me around 1.78 for this resolution here. I'm literally just dividing 960 by 540. So then if I take this aspect ratio and I multiply just my X UV coordinate by it, it's going to now make this in the range of negative 1.78 to positive 1.78 on the X axis, and then still keep it at negative one to one on the Y axis, right? So now I kind of more or less have an aspect ratio correct UV coordinate. And to demonstrate this, I could easily write some code that will discard uh, basically any pixels or at least set them to black in this case. I don't know what's behind there to discard, but we'll basically set anything that is greater than uh, one, right, to just be black. And actually we'll have to do the same thing uh, for less than, because obviously we have negative one on the other side. So let's just write that. Maybe let's just bring this up here. And then if that if statement is true, we'll just set it RGB to vec three zero. Okay, so need some more uh, parentheses. <laughs> and there we go, right? So now you can see we have this kind of letterboxing. We have these black bars on, on, on either side because that is outside of the range. We didn't really have to do this for the Y axis because we know that's negative one to one. But anyway, point is that is how we can kind of make sure that we're dealing with a square in the middle, which has been the entire point thus far. Now I realize this isn't really too relevant to circles, but hopefully this is just some helpful general GLSL advice maybe, and also some shaded toy tips. So let's summarize what, what we've done so far because it is, is possibly getting complicated, right? So what we have now is a this UV variable, which in the middle is zero, zero, that is the coordinate. And then on each of these kind of corners, it is negative one or positive one. Right, so in this case, it's negative one on the X and one on Y, right? Over here, it's positive one on both the X and the Y axes. They're both, both the X and the Y variables inside this UV variable. So now let's kind of take it back to what a circle is mathematically. So the way that we define a circle is a point and then also a size. So a radius. Now the point is irrelevant to any of this shader code. Why? Because the actual location of the geometry, the transform of the geometry is what determines where this circle will be in our game world, right? Or in whatever world it is, it doesn't have to be a game world. So we can just forget about that because in our case, that point is zero, zero, and it, it's in the middle. Now the radius, that's important because what that's going to define is how big our circle is. Now, as I mentioned earlier, because this goes through the render pipeline, we do in fact have a scale parameter that is external to all of this. We could draw a quad on the screen this big or that big, and it has nothing to do with the code that renders the quad. It's everything to do with the transform matrix and specifically the scale within that transform component. So because of that, the size is kind of irrelevant because again, that's external. If we want a smaller circle, we simply draw a smaller quad, meaning that like this actual thing here is smaller. So really what we're trying to do is maximize the radius within the quad, right? I want it to go all the way to the edge. What does that mean? Well, for a quad that has a range of negative one to one, it means the radius should be one, right? Because the diameter in that case will be two and it will perfectly fill our quad, or in this case, our render area that we have over here. So to summarize, we just want a circle where zero, zero is the origin, meaning that we don't even really need to consider the origin. And then one is the radius. It's like a unit circle. It's all very, very simple. So now that we're aware of like the mathematical representation of this circle, how do we actually draw it? Well, when it comes down to it, all we're really trying to do is look at this kind of image and then determine which pixel is inside the circle and which pixel is outside of the circle. Because if the, if the pixel is inside the circle, then we should shade it with whatever color we want the circle to be. To start off with, we'll be rendering filled in circles. And then if the pixel that we're processing is outside of the, of the range of this circle, then we probably want to just discard that pixel or in Shader Toy's case, cause we can't really blend with anything underneath without like creating a new layer and doing all of that complex stuff. So we'll just render that as black. But in your, in your own kind of game engine, you probably want to discard that pixel or like set the alpha to zero or something like that. So since circles are in fact just that 
radius, what we really need is a way to calculate the distance between this origin point and any given pixel. Because remember, every single pixel over here in this image runs through this line of code. So for every pixel, we need to calculate its distance from the origin point, so from zero, so just its distance, and then see if it is less than the radius. Because if it's less than the radius, which is one, then perfect, it's inside the circle, otherwise it's outside. So how do we calculate the distance of each pixel? Well, do we have some kind of coordinate system we can use? And of course we do. The coordinate system is that UV variable that we made. So the UV variable is the coordinate of each pixel on our screen at its, at its given position. And that UV coordinate is just like a two dimensional vector, which if we just measure the length of the vector, because zero is the middle, then we will in fact get the length of the vector being the distance between the origin and that pixel in this kind of local space. So how do we get the length of a vector? Well, there is of course a length function. So let's go ahead and calculate the distance as length of UV. And then what I'll do is, uh, we don't really need this anymore, I might just leave it down here. But what I'll do is I'll output the uh, frag color as being just VEC3 distance. So the RGB values are just going to be this distance and this is what we end up with. Now I might just get rid of these uh, black bars over here so you can see the full image. But of course, because we have this aspect ratio, it still conforms to be like a proper circle and not an ellipse, right? If I got rid of this, then that's where we get that stretching. And so that's why I added it. Now, another common way to actually calculate the length in GLSL, which you may have seen, is by calculating the dot product of the vector with itself, right? Which gives us this, and then square rooting that result, right? I've seen that a lot as well. Now, this and this is technically identical. If you actually open up the GLSL documentation and you take a look at what the length function does, you can see that it literally like squares each component here and then square roots it, right? It does the same thing. And of course, a dot product is going to take like the first X component and then multiply it with the X component of the second vector that you're dotting and then add, you know, y0 times y1. But when you're dotting a vector with itself, then obviously it's just x times x plus y times y, right? Which ends up being the same as x squared plus y squared. And to calculate the vector's magnitude or its length, you then square root that, right? So effectively it's doing the same thing. I'm not sure if maybe some people think this is faster. I honestly don't know because I'm sure that length is probably, I don't know, maybe they do it to save a function call. Length doesn't necessarily have to be calling these functions. Anyway, I don't know. Point is, I think it makes a lot more sense to just write length. So let's talk about this distance for a minute. If you look at the image on the left, you can see the middle is black, right? Why is it black? Because at that point, the distance is zero. The distance between the middle, right, the origin, and a pixel very close by is gonna be very low. That's why the value is so dark and black in the very middle, zero minus zero is zero. However, as we get further out, it lightens up. Now here, it kind of hits white and then it remains white. It's still going up. It's just that the values get clamped back to one. I don't think this is like an HDR buffer or anything capable of of storing numbers above one, right above 255. So because of that, it just kind of gets clamped. But you can actually see that if I like, for example, uh, take the color and I subtract like 0.5 from it, you can see that kind of radius expands because I'm just I'm just kind of bringing down that color range so that we can actually see more colors, if that makes sense, even though we're just kind of looking at a different range of colors. Okay, so now that we have this distance, what can we do with it and how does it help us with our circle? Well, clearly we seem to have already rendered a circle. The problem is the color is not really constant. Also, it seems to kind of be almost the opposite of what we want. I would want the outsides to be black and then the circle in the middle to be white. So to fix that, the first thing we can do is actually invert this color. Just doing one minus length is going to make it so that now the middle is one. And then as we get further out, we go down to zero instead of going up to one. And then we actually go negative. And again, if I go to distance and I add like 0.5, you can see that expand because we're just now visualizing kind of numbers that are, that are less than zero, 
by shifting them up to be above zero so that we can see them. But the problem with this is that again, we have this kind of nice smooth gradient. I don't want that. I just want the I just want the color to be either either this or that, right? But to make that happen, it's really simple. All I have to do is say that if the distance is greater than zero, then I can, for example, in this case, because we're setting the color to be the distance, I can set the distance to be one. And then we're basically done because now as soon as we get above above a zero and we're in kind of positive number territory, we know that we are within the bounds of our circle. Now, if we look at this mathematically in the form of a graph, let's see what's going on here. So we have this graph, we have, uh, let's just label this as X and Y. So our X axis is going to be the distance and then our Y axis is the color because that's kind of like our result, right? Now, the thing with this is that we've actually inverted this. If you go back here, then you can see that We've inverted the distance. So in other words, uh, let's maybe make this point over here zero, and then we'll make this like negative 0.5 or something. So what we have is we have this kind of a value here, which is our distance. It goes all the way until it hits one. And remember one is kind of like the very center. If I get rid of this, it will be a little bit easier to understand. One is this very center. And then as we get further out, we will eventually drop below zero. So in other words, it's kind of like we're going this way you can kind of read this graph from right to left instead of left to right. But anyway, point is we have this value over here. This is one, a distance of one because we've inverted it. So that's the middle of our circle. And then as we get further out, this distance decreases and then eventually falls below zero. So what we're kind of doing at the moment is we're saying, okay, well, if it's above zero, then this is the value I want, right? I just want it to be exactly one. And of course we should label this as one. But then as soon as we get below zero, on this kind of distance axis, then we immediately make it zero. So this is what we've kind of created here. And if we just connect the two dots here, then this is like what the graph would look like. We've basically gone from having a linear graph like this to something like this, which is like a, a step function, basically, like a square wave. So what we can actually do is instead of using an if statement for this inside GLSL, we can actually use the step function because there is a function called step and it matches the mathematical step function. And it basically lets us just simply specify like an edge, like as if this is like a cliff and this is the edge and then an actual obviously value that we're putting into this step function. So if we take a look at the GLSL documentation, then you can see we have this step function over here, takes in two parameters, the edge, which is the location of the edge of the step function and x the value to be used to generate the step function. So again, the edge is in our case, zero, because zero is like the edge of this cliff. And then what's going to happen is that if we basically cross that edge, it's going to give us a one, otherwise it's going to give us zero. That's just how the step function works. So d will be like the x variable that we pass in over here. That's going to be D, the distance, and then the edge is just simply going to be this like turning point zero. So if we go back to our shader, let's go ahead and use that. So instead of using this if statement, I'm instead going to say, so what we, we were actually setting distance to one. So let's just go ahead and try and set distance to be step zero, because the edge of course goes first, which is a little bit confusing. I never really liked that, but anyway, we'll put in uh, the edge and then distance itself is going to be like the X uh, variable. And if we compile that, then you can see we get exactly the same result as before, but now we're using math fun times. But of course, the thing that I should definitely point out here is that the step function, uh, well, that it's, it's the same, like it uses branches. So, um, if you want to write code, like if, you know, distance uh, greater than zero, set distance one, go ahead, honestly, because the implementation is basically identical. The reason why I'm saying that this is math is not because it's literally multiplication, you know, subtraction, addition, that kind of stuff, but because it's an actual like mathematical function that we can use for a lot more than just like that if statement. And it's just a little bit more kind of generic, I guess. It's a little bit more used in the industry. So that's basically it when it comes down to like the simplest way to basically draw like a filled in circle. Because this color is white and this outside is black, you you can also easily multiply this with any color and you will get that other color. If I multiply white with orange, I'm going to get orange because white is simply one. Now, what I could do if I was actually trying to like blend this with existing, like, you know, to composite it on top of like an existing color buffer or existing pixels, then I could, instead of affecting like RGB here and setting like the background to zero or whatever, I could instead just have this affect the alpha channel. So in other words, I could set the alpha to be this and then otherwise the alpha would be zero instead. Right. And if I did that, it's not really going to work here. Um, and of course you, uh, 
you want to um, actually do this, right? It's not really gonna work here. And in this case, you would set the frag color, the RGB to be the actual color of the circle. You don't need to do any multiplication. And then you would just set the alpha to be like the distance and then that will be it. But this is shader toy. There's nothing underneath. So I'll still keep treating it as RGB. Okay, so we have a way to render a filled in circle, but what if I want like a donut or what if I want like a really thin, not filled in circle? How do I do that? Well, in that case, if we go back to our diagram here, I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar to what we have now. It's just that instead of allowing this to be one for the entire duration, what I kind of want to do instead is make it go back down to zero. I kind of want to do this, right? Where this doesn't exist anymore. And then I basically have a B1, meaning it's filled in, those pixels are filled in with some kind of color for a short distance between zero and like 0 0.1. And then it just goes back down to zero. So in other words, if I try to write this logically, so like distance, if distance is greater than 0.1, right, which should be that kind of border that we're looking at, right? So this is zero, this is like 0 0.1. Therefore, if it's greater than 0.1, let's reduce it back down to zero. If I was to try and write that like this as well, uh, it's not going to work. And the reason, the reason why it's not going to work is because the distance has already been affected by that by that step function. We don't want that to happen. We need the actual real distance, not the process distance that will that is really just used for color. So what we'll do is we'll change this to be our color. I'll just call it col col. Uh, and then that's going to be a vec3 um, of our kind of step here. And then this color is what we're going to set our frag color to be. Now, if I do something like this, I can actually use distance and then maybe set the color you know, to be zero. And then if I take a look at that, then of course it's going to give us this, where the distance here again is like the kind of thinness of your circle. Now, can we do this using a step function? Of course we can. We just need to take that existing color and multiply it by a step. And I'll wrap this in a VEC3 as well. We're going to take this value as the, as the edge of our step function. We'll pass in that existing distance value. However, if we take a look at that, we still get the same result because we're kind of doing a step the other way. If you take a look at this, what we're really doing is we're actually going down like that instead of going up like we were before. So to fix that up, we actually need to reverse the result of our step function by just inverting it. So one minus step, and then we'll get this same result. Now, this is our thickness parameter. I might just bring it up so that it makes more sense. This is going to be our thickness. That's what that edge is. And then what I can do for fun is just actually assign that to be the X coordinate of the mouse. And we'll divide it by iResolution.x so that we get it from pixel space into this kind of screen space. And then what I can actually do is click and drag my mouse and you can see it's actually going to change the thickness of my circle, pretty cool. Now, if I set this thickness uh, manually to something like one, that will result in having a filled in circle. Okay, brilliant, looks really good does it? And the answer is it doesn't. Why? Because, well, we have this really hard edge. And the reason that's happening is because everything's very like robotic. There's no kind of smooth fading. It's just literally a step function, which we know as soon as it hits a particular value, it drops, right? The function as we know, looks like this. It's really sharp. It means that if we look at a group of pixels, if this pixel is inside the circle, it's white and the pixel next to it is just immediately black. There is no kind of smooth transition or fading that we would want to reduce that aliasing and the kind of rough edge there. So what can we do about it? Well, ideally we would kind of have a bigger transition between these pixels where instead of just going from white to black instantly, maybe we would go to kind of like a, a gray, which I'll just show like this, and then we'll go to black, right? So in other words, we kind of, we, we smoothly fade from that one value from white to black. So can we do that? Well, yeah, pretty easily actually, because turns out the step function has a smoother cousin called smooth step. So if we take a look at smooth step in the documentation, you can see that it's it basically does like the, it works the same way as a step function, but there are two edges instead of one. And the reason there are two edges is because the function looks something like this. So what you're specifying here is basically the edge at which it begins and then the edge at which this kind of smooth interpolation ends. So you could like really stretch this out and make it that big where these are the two edges, or you could be really like, you know, really kind of not that smooth at all and make make the edges closer together and therefore you get like less, less of a long fade, right? And in fact, if you make the edges equal, 
then there is like no distinction between them, which means it is basically just a regular step function. So let's try that out. What we'll do is we'll go back to our code and instead of using a step over here, I'm gonna change it to be smooth step. And then now we have to decide between what kind of two distances, I guess, are we doing that kind of faded interpolation. Now zero, zero is our absolute boundary, right? Because what we're doing is we're rendering a quad and zero, a distance of zero in our code equates to being like literally on the edge. So we can't go any, anything out, outside of that range will simply not be rendered. So we can't actually extend the bounds that way. We have to do everything within this canvas, within our render area. So what that means is that this actually has to be a larger value, we can't go negative. So if we set it to something like, I don't know, 0.1 and take a look at what that looks like, well, we get, that's quite a big distance. So we get this kind of blurry look, right? But if we set, if we set it to be something rather small, then it starts to look a lot better. And in Hazel, I think this value is set to 0 0.005. So if you really zoom in on that, or if you look at it in full screen, then you can see it actually looks really good. Feel free to play around with this. I don't know, like maybe 0.2 would be better if it's like larger, because there are more pixels. Just looking, there are more pixels to render. So on my Quad HD monitor, this actually looks pretty good, but you should be able to see the difference between using smooth step and then regular step, right? I'll kind of show you both examples in the video. So this kind of fade parameter is also something that you could bring out, so float fade. Uh, and then you can kind of tweak that. And yeah, you can, you can of course make it really big and then maybe use that as a stylistic effect as well. I'm gonna leave it at 0 0.005. But what about for the inside circle? So if the thickness is like 0.1 or something, the inside is still jagged. Can we use it for that as well? And the answer is of course. So this becomes thickness minus fade and then thickness. And now we have a nice smooth result. Now this is inverted, right? So what we can actually do is kind of change this a little bit where we just flip the edges and then suddenly it becomes less of that and more of that, right? And so to do that, we can just basically move this minus fade to be on the second edge and then that will create this, but then we can just remove that inversion. So we've just saved that little one minus, we don't need it anymore. And we can still have our nice, beautiful circle. So there we go, we have a nice smooth circle. We can control the thickness using like the mouse or something and everything looks good. There is one slight problem left though, because we did in fact do this kind of smooth step now and we're subtracting fade. What that means is that if we set the thickness to be one, because we want this to be a perfect circle, a perfect filled in circle, there is in fact a hole in the middle. And the reason is because we're subtracting that fade. So thickness is one, but we're subtracting fade. Now to remedy this, what you could do if you wanted to is just kind of add on the fade and then it will go away, or you can just arbitrarily set this to like a larger number, right? You could have an if statement that says if it's one, then maybe don't even do this calculation. That's also a possible solution. There's a few solutions. But I think what you could do is just maybe always just add the fade to the thickness. And then what that means is that like you might not be able to make it as thin as possible anymore because a thickness of zero will give you a thickness of 0 0.005, but you probably wouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, and then you'll be able to perfectly go to one like that. Now, what you could also do, which I realized while editing this video, is instead of just adding on this fade, if I get rid of that and we get that hole back, instead of doing that, what you could do is just simply change the way that this fade is applied to the smooth step. So instead of subtracting it from this side, we could actually add it to this side of the smooth step. So to the first edge. That effectively gives us the same kind of result, the same kind of behavior. Instead of subtracting it from here, we're adding it onto here, which still means that this edge is larger than this edge, but it just means that we've kind of moved around the placement of it so that it, it does the same thing as what I did in the video, but this just obviously looks a lot cleaner. Now, finally, again, with the color, just, just take the color and then multiply it by whatever you want. So if I wanted like a nice, maybe like orangey kind of color, there we go. I'm just simply multiplying that white by whatever I want. And of course I get 
my color. So that is how we can render some rather nice looking circles. I'll leave a link in the description below to this shader toy example that I've written here. So from here, it should be pretty easy to take this and integrate it into any kind of game engine or just a graphics project. As I mentioned, if you guys wanna see me integrate this into maybe like the batch renderer series or into, I'll have to integrate this into get the game engine series in Hazel 2D anyway. So that video will definitely be coming out, but either way, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to hit the like button. Also, let me know what your thoughts are regarding rendering circles in the comment section below. How are you rendering circles? Maybe there's like some other technique I'm not aware of. Let me know. Hopefully this video was helpful to you. If it was, please consider helping to support the channel by going to patreon.com slash the channel. Your support is what makes videos like this one possible. And you can also get access to Hazel and all of its source code. Thank you guys for watching the video. I hope you have an amazing day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.